Okay, good morning, everyone. Off to our second program here for Sacred Trust. Welcome. In case you don't know me, my name is Wayne Motts, and it's my honor to be the President Chief Executive Officer here at the Gettysburg Foundation, the nonprofit partner of the Gettysburg National Military Park and the Eisenhower National Historic Site, and we are co-sponsoring this event with the National Park Service. I first want to give a shout out to Steve Sims, the superintendent of Gettysburg National Military Park, his entire team for everything they're doing, including Chris Gwynn, the chief of interpretation here. And of course, a shout out to my teams at the Gettysburg Foundation facilities and sales and marketing coming in to help us make all this possible. Yes, setting up this tent is a lot of trouble, everybody. And the big screen and everything else but we're so glad you're here. And our next speaker has come 3,000 miles to be with you. We've got the best speakers here at the Gettysburg Foundation, and we're so happy to have Dr. Allison Johnson with us here today. This is a very unusual topic. So our next presenter today, Professor Allison M. Johnson, she will discuss 333 veterans who submitted handwriting samples and personal narratives to William O. Borns, did I say that right? Borns, okay. Two left-handed penmanship contests of which 20 of the people that entered, 20, had lost their right arms and the use of their uh, right arms or hands at Gettysburg. And many more, of course, fought in the battle. She will focus on how the left-handed arm veterans understood and wrote about their service and sacrifice, looking specifically at their expectations during what one of the contestants called, quote, the turning point of the war, end quote. And let's, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Johnson. She's assistant professor of English, yes, at San Jose State University in California, specializing in 19th century American print culture. She's the author of The Scars We Carve, Bodies and Wounds in the Civil War Print Culture, Louisiana State University Press. She's the co-editor of Religion and its Reformation in America, beginning to 1730, an anthology of primary sources, published by Baylor University in 2020, and the editor of The Left Armed Corps, Writings of Amputee Civil War Veterans, hence the topic today. Allison's work also appeared in the Cambridge Companion to the Litur Liturgy of the American Civil War and Reconstruction. So all the way, 3,000 miles, help me welcome Dr. Allison Johnson. <laughs> First of all, thank you to Wayne uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor to come all the way from California. And thank you all for, for being here. Is this sound okay? Okay. I wanted to start off by just asking if we have any left-handers. I know at least two of you are. All right, I'm not good at math, but that looks like a, maybe about 10% of the crowd. I don't know. 10% of the population is left-handed. Now, in the 19th century, anyone want to guess what percentage was, was left-handed? I heard zero. I heard low. Lower? 2%. Uh, only 2%, I mean, technically probably 10% were, but they were forced to write with their right hands because left-handedness, no offense anybody in the audience, was considered sinister. That's, we, get the, we get the word sinister from the Latin word for left, sinistra. And left is from an old English word that means weak. Again, no offense. I'm pro, I'm pro left-handedness. I am myself a right-hander, though I have, to, I have to start saying that. Um, so the men I'm going to talk about today ostensibly were right-handed prior to uh, their service in the Civil War. Though when you look at some of their handwriting samples, it seems like maybe they had left hand. They were potentially. They're just so good. Their, their, their penmanship is much better than anything I could produce with my right hand. But I'll let you be the judge when I send you, uh, when I show you some of the examples. Um, I came upon this collection of very interesting papers in the reading room of the Library of Congress. I was there looking for writings by Civil War soldiers, and one of the librarians there, who I am forever indebted to, recommended this collection called the William Olin Bourne Papers. That became a chapter in my dissertation, which then became a book, and then uh, that inspired by a chapter in the book, I 
produced a collection of these writings. Uh, William Olin Bourne, the man who organized the competitions, he had hoped to, print, to publish all of the writings, but he never did. So even though I'm barely scratching the surface, and there's so many, it would, be a thousand, it would be thousands of pages to publish all of these writings. Uh, fortunately, you can view them. They've all been digitized by the Library of Congress. Um, if you're interested in that, I can, can tell you how to access that. Um, but you can also buy my book and, and see a very nicely curated and edited, because uh, I'm pretty good at reading 19th century penmanship, luckily. So I'm going to talk about the contestants, the contests, and the cultural, literary, and historical significance of the entries before focusing on the experiences at Get their experiences at Gettysburg, as well as the post-war lives of some of the veterans. Because to the best of my ability, I've tracked down all 333 of these, of these veterans. There are a few that I just can't find, but other than that. In 1864, a recuperating Union soldier named F.L. Mahan scrawled his name. This is, this is him up here. He was a sergeant, as you can see. Uh, he scrawled his name, regiment, and hometown in large sloppy letters on the page of a reminiscence book. A reminiscence book is sort of an autograph book. I had one from Disneyland when I was a kid, but this was a 19th century version, the reminiscence book, where people would, would um, sign their names. Beneath his entry, another hand that was quite a bit steadier wrote, this was written with the left hand. Uh, Mr. Mahan lost his right arm in the Battle of Reseca, Georgia, 15th May, 1864, under General Hooker, W.O.B. A year later, W.O.B., William Olin Bourne, most likely inspired by his interactions with men like Mahan, Mahan I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm going to say Mahan, um, <clears throat> held the first of two left-handed penmanship contests. He had been a hospital volunteer and a chaplain during the war. He was also a newspaper editor who published a newspaper called The Soldier's Friend that was targeted, obviously, to Union soldiers and um, printed reports from the War Department, poetry, and also writings by men who had, had served. Um, he called on men who had lost their right arms while fighting for the Union to submit specimens of their best left-handed business writing in the form of personal statements. So remember, there's no typewriter, so business penmanship is very important. You need, uh, every, every business needs someone with very legible um, penmanship. Some, sent in some of the veterans sent in straightforward descriptions of their enlistment, their service, wounding, and discharge, while some reflected on the political and personal ramifications of their service. Uh, others wrote poems focusing on their changed bodies, and those are the those are the men that I talked to, I wrote about in my um, my first book. Um, that's what brought me to to this collection, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, Bourne hoped to publish, like I said, a, a memorial volume of the united production of several left arm veterans of the battlefield. Uh, he recognized this unique group because he had encountered so many of them when they came to get their prosthetic arms in the Central Park Hospital in New York um, and had met them while they were recuperating or waiting to get their government-issued um, artificial arms. He proclaimed that the manuscript, if he did publish this collection, would be one of the best literary contributions to the history of the war, as well as the memorial of an entirely new feature in literature, the United Production of these men. The Civil War has been called the Unwritten War. We've moved away from that, definitely, in recent years and recognized all of the amazing literature that arose out of it. Uh, but, you know, Walt Whitman himself said that the real war would never get into the books. But looking at the writings of these soldiers helps us at least get closer to that real war. So the volume was never published, but Bourne was right. Uh, the writings of the self-proclaimed left-arm veterans, that's what they called themselves, deserve canonical status and enable entirely new ways of understanding how Americans responded to and interpreted the Civil War. They were asked to send in, they were, the, the veterans were asked to record their experiences of the war, and hundreds of them sent in specimens of their best penmanship. The contest attempted to make the fragmented bodies of amputees useful. That was a word that the, uh, the contest used. 
and frame the penmanship specimens as proof that left arm men could successfully reintegrate into American society and the increasingly industrial workforce. So even if they couldn't push a plow anymore, many of them were farmers as were the average uh, Civil War soldiers, they could push a pen and they could find employment. Um, but the contest also provided an opportunity for amputees to construct their own identities, so to not participate fully in this rehabilitative rhetoric that's saying that, that focuses bodily wholeness on having both hands, right? They're coming up with new forms of masculinity and able-bodiedness. So many of them mourn their loss, but they also recognize the significance of their sacrifice. They saved the Union, they freed the slaves, and they were proud of it. However, their faith in the cause was at times small comfort for personal pain or the difficulty they had putting themselves back together in a society that labeled them crippled and incomplete. Bourne referred to this collection um, as the first and only of its kind. And I think I follow his lead in declaring them worthy of preservation, quote, worthy of preservation is one of the peculiar illustrations of our great conflict. Moreover, these sinister manuscripts and wounded writers demand a fundamental revision of how we think about Civil War literature and the assumptions we make about Civil War soldiers. Scholars have historically followed Whitman in proclaiming that the real war will never get in the books, but amputated limbs and these uh, veterans focus on those um, kind of contradict these claims that Union soldiers remain silent about their service. These are men who in the, after, the immediate aftermath of the war s wrote about their experience rather than suffering silently. And many of them are writing, sending these penmanship samples while they're still wounded. Their wounds are still healing. Some of them would have healing wounds until the, the 20th century. So um, after telling you a little bit about the contest and contestants, I'm going to talk about three interconnected concepts that are crucial to understanding the cultural significance of these left-handed papers, the empty sleeve, the amputated right arm, and the adaptive left arm. After that, I'll introduce some of the veterans who fought at Gettysburg and talk about their experiences there. So these are some advertisements for the contest. On the left, um, it is a, it's advertising $500 in premiums. Um, the middle one is an um, announcement of a grand exhibition of the specimens. There were two exhibitions, as I will talk about later. This one is in Seton Hall. Notice at the top, disabled but not disheartened, the left arm core again in the field. On July 29, 1865, the New York Times ran an article titled Left-Handed Penmanship, and it announced a contest to furnish, quote, fresh pleasure or benefit for the soldiers. The article informs the reader that William Olin Bourne, quote, now offers premiums amounting to $500 for the four best specimens of penmanship by left arm soldiers of the Union. Any man who has lost his right arm in the service may compete. He may write an original or selected article upon a patriotic theme, and he must not write less than two or more than seven pages. The writer must also give his name in full, his regiment, company, and rank, the list of battles in which he was engaged, the place where he lost his arm, and his post office address. So there were some pretty strict rules. He eventually got rid of that page limit because these, some of these guys wrote, I always call them guys. I'm not, being, I'm not meaning to be disrespectful. It's just that I, I got to know them so well while I was doing my research. But these men, um, these veterans sent in, some of them, 20 pages of, of left-handed writing, really just telling their whole story. The committee in charge of reading, I, it's indicated on the left, uh, the left broadside, uh, included William Cullen Bryant, who was a very famous poet. How many of you have heard, for, heard of him? All right, that's pretty good, because he was very, very famous at, at the time, not so famous nowadays. Um, and the president of the Sanitary Commission uh, and President Theodore Roosevelt's father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., um, and they were all, and he was part of the New York Bureau of Employment that was intended to help veterans find employment uh, following the war. 270 men sent penmanship samples to the first contest, and 113 veterans sent submissions to the second contest. So it kind of fell off 
in, in terms of participation. The second contest rewarded 10 veterans with $50 premiums and autographed letters written by union officers such as Grant, Farragut, and Sheridan. So they, that, was, that was part of the, um, the, the prize is that you would receive this letter that Grant himself wrote telling you why he chose your, your penmanship sample. And I actually got to hold, hold that letter when I came upon these papers. It was pretty amazing. Um, Broadsides and invitations, some bearing slogans like disabled but not disheartened, uh, announced the grand exhibition of left-hand left -hand penmanship by soldiers and sailors who have lost their right arms during the war. And the two ex exhibitions, one in New York and one in DC, displayed the submissions for the first contest. Uh, lots of people came. Grant went to both. Um, Andrew Johnson did not go, even though he said uh, that he would, which is another thing we can hold against Andrew Johnson. <laughs> Um, and, but it was a very popular, very popular exhibition. People were amazed by what they saw as proof of the federal soldiers' um, resilience and the American spirit. Directions for the second competition instructed entrants to submit signed affidavits. So previously in the first, first contest, they just had to list you know, their name, their hometown, their regiment, and um, where, where and when they had lost their arm. Uh, it got a little bit more serious in the second competition. Uh, they had to affirm that they had actually been disabled, that they had, where, where they had lost, you can't really see it very well, but it's, it, no, it mentions the battle where they lost their arm, had to be notarized, um, and that was to, and, and, off, and also they could send in photographs. Uh, of themselves. So while some contestants sent the typical kind of three-quarter view where you would just see from here up, others sent in photographs displaying their, their, missing, um, their, their, their missing right arms, or, and some of them sent in pictures displaying them writing with their left hand. This guy, Burrett Stiles, of the Company A 14th Connecticut, he sent in two pictures. One showing his amputation at the shoulder, and the second one showing him playing the violin with his prosthetic arm. And most, most men who lost their arms at the shoulder, the, the artificial arms didn't fit very well. So I don't know how good that violin is gonna sound, but it looks cool in the picture. Um, but again, he's displaying his, his newfound abilities. Veterans who participated in the contest were almost exclusively volunteers, by which I mean they, none of them, only one of them was drafted as far as I can tell and another one was a substitute. Um, everybody else enlisted. Most of them enlisted in the first year of the war, 34 of them in April 1861, so the first month of the war. Some fought in a long list of battles while others were wounded in their first engagement. 24 lost their arms in and around Petersburg, 21 at Cold Harbor, and 20 here at Gettysburg. Veterans from New York submitted the most entries, which makes sense because Bourne was, was located in New York, and that's where news of the contest first was shared. Um, Ohioans and Il Illinoisans, I think is how you pronounce it, were a distant second and third. Um, 30 commissioned officers, 52 non-coms, and 185 privates participated in the first contest, 21 commissioned, and 34 non-commissioned in the second contest. Though around 179,000 black men served in the Union Army, only two submitted to the first contest and none to the second. And this was potentially due to lower literacy rates among formerly enslaved men, though many became literate during and after the war. The youngest contestant was 15 when he enlisted. He later became the first man executed by Knox County, Ohio after murdering someone. That's a, I have all these little interesting anecdotes about, about these veterans that I would love to share, but moving on. Uh, and the oldest was 52 when he enlisted. He was passing as a late 40s man, I guess. I think he told them he was 48. At least 53 of the contestants were born abroad, so not quite the percent. It doesn't not quite reflective of the percentage of Union soldiers who were foreign born, um, but close. And this is before I move on. This is Burrett Stiles' handwriting on the right. Pretty impressive. He wrote in 
Bourne's reminiscence book in the hospital when he was getting that left, getting his prosthetic arm. Um, and then he submitted to both contests. Okay. Like I mentioned, there are three kind of concepts I wanted to go over that were very prevalent in the popular literature of the time. So in popular literature, like, and in also in illustrations like this one, usually the empty sleeve speaks on behalf of silent veterans. So this is a very famous um, engraving of a young child that's trying to figure out what has happened to his or her father. And we have this very morose looking veteran sort of staring off into the distance and not, and not speaking on behalf of himself. This on the left is from William Ollenborn's paper. It was published in 1868. And it describes just the wide prevalence of these empty sleeves. So again, we're reducing a person to their sleeve as opposed to this is a, this is a man, this is a veteran. No, this is a sleeve uh, that is walking around. Um, and this is in line with the contest itself in that uh, Bourne, who was a non-disabled man, had seen the results of amputation but not endured the surgeon's saw. Um, he hoped that contest entries, a collection of fragments, would augur not just the eventual reunification, reconstruction of the fragmented nation, but also the successful reintegration of amputees into an increasingly capitalistic American society. So veterans like this one uh, could not look so sad and become part of, of the um, re-enter the workforce. As I'll show though, the testimonies of the veterans complicate the op optimistic aspirations of the contest and call into question whether assertions that artificial limbs can fully replace amputated ones. Um, so they, the veterans, rather than letting these sleeves speak on their behalf, send in these personal statements uh, and tell their own stories. Notice empty sleeves that speak more eloquently than tongue or type. Rely, they're relying on the sleeve to do the talking instead of the, the, the soldier himself. According to the Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion, the Union Army reported 16,147 amputations involving parts or all of the arm and 13,833 amputations of any part of the leg. So there were more men walking around with empty sleeves than empty pant legs. Um, and the empty sleeve more so than the empty pant leg was, was considered very symbolic or, and significant. There was a poem inspired by or related to this, um, this engraving called the empty sleeve that again emphasizes how the sleeve tells of sacrifice and service on behalf of a wounded man. This is Henry Meacham, a real life empty sleeve veteran recreating that, that, um, that illustration. I just, I'm just showing you this just to give you an idea of how prevalent that kind of rhetoric were, was, that this is a soldier, the, the child is relying on the sleeve to tell the story as opposed to the veteran himself. So you suffer in silence where, while your, your sleeve speaks for you. Till this very hour, I could ne'er believe what a telltale thing is an empty sleeve. What a weird, queer thing is an empty, empty sleeve. So like I said, the sleeve, not the veteran, tells a generic story of a soldier departing the domestic space to answer the country's call. Um, let's see. So the poem and the illustrations, there are multiple illustrations as I mentioned, they're working in tandem to create this sanitized view of the war. It, the empty sleeve is covering over an amputation, am, an amputation stump. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna skip a few things. There was also a song called The Empty Sleeve. It was, as I said, it was very, very popular. However, amputation stumps and clumsy left hands are much more prevalent in the contest entries that the, the veterans sent in than artificial limbs and empty sleeves. Instead of letting their sleeves work for them, or speak for them, the left arm corps purposefully participated in a collective act of testifying to both national trauma and individual experience. 
They refused to become objects of pity, and they invested their left arms and missing or maimed right arms with significant symbolic power. Penmanship, the contest assert, will enable one-armed veterans to support themselves and their families, despite the absence of what to, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman called the best part of their bodies. This is part of his letter to Caleb Fisher, who won a $50 prize um, bestowed by Sherman himself. Whilst we have been accustomed to regard the loss of the right arm as almost fatal to a useful and consequently happy life, these samples show how nature substitutes wisely and well our other arm. And I hope and trust that you may enjoy a long life crowned by the contentment which the sacrifice of the best part of your body, again, no offense to left-handed people out there, um, to your country's flag and safety is calculated to give. So the best, these men have lost what, what is considered at the time the best parts of their body. But Sherman is articulating a very prevalent way of understanding the loss of life and limb in the war for the Union. Soldiers died and lost part of their body in order to make the Union whole. In substituting their left hand for their right hand, they would ostensibly reestablish their masculine competency and potency, because some of them are concerned about their continued ability to provide for their families, even their continued ability to find romantic partners, as I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, let's see. Many entered professions that didn't require as much manual labor, so they followed, they became clerks, they worked for the government, many worked for the pension department, um, the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and such professional and personal transitions weren't easy or immediate, and often involved anxieties about incompetence and impotence. Um, they, some of them talk about, like I said, they worry about rejection following bodily disfigurement. So they're coming home from the war different uh, than they uh, left. One of these veterans is named Phineas P. Whitehouse, an excellent 19th century name. He was a corporal for the 6th New Hampshire Volunteers, and he competed in both contests, and he was very prolific. He, he wrote a lot, and he wrote a lot of poetry. He was known as a, a soldier poet. And this is his poem, My Crippled Arm, which won a $25 prize for literary merit. Um, and he's apostrophizing his, his shattered, the shattered remnant that remains. So he didn't, some of the men didn't fully lose their right arms. They lost the ability to use them. So they had, they maintained at least part or the whole right arm, but it was no longer um, usable if that makes sense. And he's one of those men. So he looked ostensibly like he had both arms, but he actually had one, only one functioning arm. So he talks about how it was hardy once and strong for manly labor, how it could shoulder a musket or could turn the saber, could wield the pen or till New England soil. It could perform these manly duties. Um, and he, he looks at it and now sees that it is shapeless. He sees a rough scar. It, is, it has childlike fingers. Um, I look at this feeble thing before me, this piteous wreck of what was once an arm, and can you wonder if a cloud comes o'er me? So can you wonder that he is a little bit depressed about that? Um, he ends the poem, though, with the hope that his final, his, his, the arm that is left to him, they will find a final victory. Um, this is Phineas P. Whitehouse. You'll notice that he is emphasizing his left arm as opposed to his, his right arm. Uh, let's see. So he is constructing, as I mentioned, a new form of wholeness and masculinity, one that doesn't rely on an artificial limb or a right hand. I mentioned sinister, that that's the, the word comes from the Latin word for left. So Thomas Perrine, one of my favorite veterans, he sent in a sinister manuscript, a left-handed manuscript. Um, and he addresses the physical, economic, and interpersonal re repercussions of losing his right arm. He was wounded at Chancellorville, uh, Chancellorsville, he, his first and only battle. Uh, and he claims that losing his right arm is tantamount to losing his identity as an enfranchised white American man, as you can see here. Uh, he, re he, he describes, um, well, what adds old insult to injury is that losing his right arm also resulted in romantic re rejection. 
he plays with the etymological and actual importance of hands to courtship rituals. As such, his stump embodies his concerns about impotency and fears that losing an arm has made them less of a man. Uh, so he offers a jilt, uh, the woman who's about to jilt him his other hand. And she said, "'Twas all that I had left, I said, she said, "'twould not be right." So he's using these puns and these um, to reflect insecurity and, re and the fears of rejection. since he re has returned home lacking the hand he had previously promised to his sweetheart. Let's see. Luckily for Perrine, he did marry after the war. Oh, and I did what, just want to mention, in this second, in this, in this portion right here, he's referring to the Dred Scott case. Um, Dred Scott was an enslaved man who sued for his freedom, and Judge Taney, the chief justice, they rejected that that suit. So basically, Perrine is saying he might as well be black. Of course, this isn't really, this is obviously not true uh, in that he is still a white man. He is, but he's linking, this is showing how able-bodiedness is linked to citizenship and to voting rights. Um, but he says at least one consolation is that they'll never be able to draft him. When they say two arms, he'll just say, I only have one arm. Sort of funny, sort of chuckle, get it? Two arms? No? Okay. Um, excellent. It's like I'm, I'm like I'm teaching my students. Just a little chuckle sometimes to make me feel better. Okay. Um, Henry W. Palmer is another another veteran that I wanted to mention, uh, and he actually he was a 20 year old veteran of the 31st Maine Volunteers, and he apostrophizes his missing right arm, and even uses some legal language to say that his left arm has inherited everything that his right arm has relinquished because his right arm is enriching Virginia soil. This is the most impressive, uh, in, my, in my mind, um, contestant in terms of ornamental penmanship, which was an art at the time, an art form at the time. Uh, this is Alfred D. Whitehouse, not related to Phineas, uh, he was a painter before the war and also after the war, so he was able to continue his his profession. Um, you'll notice he he is he call he includes his portrait and also is proclaiming that he is one of the left arm corps. His poetry is not great. That's okay. The rhyming is a little bit off, but. Uh, it's pretty powerful in terms of the message. The right arm's gone, the, the nation yet remains. Though many perish, yet we are saved. The right will triumph over wrong, though it leave us but one left arm strong. And he lost his, his, um, his arm in the first battle of the war, so he was pretty much fully healed by the time he did this and had obviously had some, a lot of time to practice. But I still think that's way better than anything I could do with my right hand. So I want to talk about Gettysburg now. Obviously, that is where we are. Uh, and, and we're on this hollowed ground. So I wanted to focus in on some of the members of the Left Arm Corps who fought at Gettysburg. And, and many of them recognize the significance of the battle and their service there in its immediate aftermath. So they didn't need time. They knew on the day, according to some of them, that this was the turning point. Elisha R. Wise was a private in Company A, 7th Pennsylvania Volunteers, later a first sergeant in the 11th Pennsylvania Volunteers. Unfortunately, he lost his treasured diary right before, right, uh, and, and his right arm during the battle. So the rebels took his knapsack, which included his diary. So he said, I'm sorry, I can't remember all of the specific dates, because those darn Johnnies took my, my diary. Um, but a gunshot fracture through the elbow joint took his arm and required amputation on July 3rd. This is what he wrote of the battle. Um, he talks about how early on the morning of the first day of July, they moved to Gettysburg to open that, quote, memorable battle. Their colonel made a few remarks. The men showed their approval of it by loud cheers and a determination to drive the rebels from their native state. So these are Pennsylvania volunteers. Remember, they're defending their state from, from the rebel incursion. 
even after he lost his arm, he was able to climb up into the belfry of a church and he was able to watch what he says, the desperate charges of the rebels, but each time they were hurled back with great slaughter. Does anyone know what he's describing? Pickett's charge, right. So he, just having lost his arm, goes up and watches Pickett's charge. Uh, he notes that all of his, his, the members of his regiment were present. They were all accounted for um, and that they were ready for the battle when it commenced. Uh, he relocated after the war to Ohio and held various public offices, including alderman and postmaster. Many of these men went on to become postmaster. Before the progressive era, government positions were very much, here I'm doing you this favor. Uh, I guess we still have that to a certain extent, um, but let me in, but men who had lost, lost their limbs were often given these positions uh, as a reward for their sacrifice, so he is one of them. And he lives until 1924. It's always great when I'm, when I'm tracking down these men to find the guys who lived late into, or not late, but into the 20th century. It's, it's sad when they die of tuberculosis a few years after, uh, after the war, um, or as a result of their wounds after the war. Uh, let's see. No, I wanted to talk about William Fithy and more. He rather pithily describes his time in Gettysburg and proves very prescient about the battle's momentous nature. He was a corporal in, the, in Company K, 12th New Jersey Volunteers, and he wrote about the morning of the third, says that, quote, charged a brick barn, capturing 90 Johns. They refer to the, they either call the Confederate soldiers Johns, Johnnies, or rebels. They never call them Confederates. Um, setting fire to the building, fell back to our line of battle in good order, although under a heavy skirmish fire, bringing all our prisoners in safe with a loss of three killed and five wounded. Lay still un until about one o'clock when all at once the Johns opened a tremendous artillery fire. The smoke had hardly cleared away when we see a heavy line of battle unmasked from the woods in the rear of their skirmish line. This was followed by two more lines of battle extending as far as the eyes could see right and left. And here's the, the portion that I have up here for you. Such determination I never before see in any engagement as we're here invinced by our men. Such cool preparations for battle. It seemed as though every soldier thought this the turning point of the war. And so I believed it and so it has proved to be. On they came, but what a reception. It only lasted about 30 minutes, but what death and destruction in those few minutes after he pulsed them, and they, then they commenced skedaddling. He slept sweetly, he says, on the night of the third, knowing that the Johns had had the, quote, worst repulse they could have. Um, Moore was later wounded at Spotsylvania Courthouse, but was able to continue his post-war work as a tinsmith. Finally, I want to talk about Wallace Mordecai Moore, another excellent name um, that I come across quite a few excellent names in my research. He was of Company E, Pennsylvania Reserve. So, so many Pennsylvania men, as you may know, wanted to join up that they had, and, and they refused to leave, even though Pennsylvania said, we have enough guys, it's okay, you can go home. They insisted on remaining, so he becomes part of the 13th Pennsylvania um, Reserves, aka the first Pennsylvania Rifles. Do we have any Pennsylvania natives in, in here? All right. So there was a lot of a lot of enthusiasm in in this area. Um, he was later a corporal of the 190th Pennsylvania, and he arrived here with his regiment at 10 a.m. on July 2nd, having marched all the previous night to get here. He's not related to, the, to William Fithy and Moore, the other Moore I talked about, but he too recognized the significance of the engagement here. There was no time for rest, he says. When they reached Gettysburg, it really seemed as though the life of the nation trembled in the scale of battle, and I never saw more willingness to face danger and death than was exhibited by all ranks. So remember, they're writing in the immediate aftermath of the war, not, not, not decades later when Gettysburg has firmly been established as, as this turning point. They recognize at the time uh, that, uh, the moment, momentous nature of the battle. This is a photograph of Wallace um, with his daughter and his grandchild. 
given to me by his great grandson, Alan Ford. So that was one of the great things about tracking down these men is I got to meet, or not meet, virtually, I was conducting this all during the pandemic, uh, but virtually meet some of the descendants of the left arm veterans. After he moved to Ohio, it's not Ohio, Iowa after the war, he built a sod house. He was elected auditor amid cheers for one armed more. And he lived to be 90 and died in 1932. The oldest veteran lived until 1937, so he was alive when my grandparents were children, which is pretty awesome. For the rest of their lives, these men, the left arm corps, carried the memory of the battle fought here. They also carried tangible proof of their service with their mangled or missing right arms. For R. Watson Sieg of the 4th Michigan, uh, he lost all use of his right arm at Gettysburg when he was shot through the lung. So again, didn't lose his arm, but lost the ability to use it because of his wound. The penmanship contest served as forms for self-expression, and if the pun can be excused, a call to arms. This is a letter that he wrote to Bourne that Bourne published in his newspaper. I hope my manuscript may recommend itself for the first credit of the well-known gentleman who composed your committee. But if it proves second to others, I shall at least be encouraged to renew diligence and perseverance in my left-handed labors. These labors, as I hope I've shown today, do important cultural and literary work. Sieg and other, other members of the Left Arm Corps offer personal accounts of amputation ad and adaptation by proposing new ways of conceptualizing heroic masculinity and bodily disfigurement. Born, the contestants testify to survival and loss, successful adaptation, and painful readjustment. Three years after the end of the war, Born reprinted an article titled Left Hand Penmanship. Uh, from Frank Leslie's Illustrated News, which was a very popular periodical at the time. It featured specimens of left-handed writing from O.O. O. Howard, uh, the famous one-armed general, and two contestants. The article argued that the contest entries are, quote, genuine testimony to the character of our volunteer soldiers, end quote. One specimen displayed the legible and superior business penmanship of Franklin H. Dura, the recipient of the first premium of $200. Shortly after winning the contest, and this is his writing right here, obviously very legible, he was most likely, most likely afflicted by PTSD, which of course was not a diagnosis at the time, and was committed to an insane asylum where he eventually died. So though his penmanship was meant to serve as a marker of survival and a, and a promise of success, he soon became another casualty of the war. And I end with that just to, to show that the stories of men like him, and though he is, he is a, a, an exception in terms of these contestants, though two other, at least two other men died by suicide, um, most of them went on to very successful lives. They were members of the great, uh, Grand Army of the Republic, for the rest of their lives, they were very proud bearers of the memory of the war. The, I include these other stories um, of the men who were not so successful to show uh, how difficult adaptation was and to show the suffering as well as the survival of these men. Um, the stories of these men who were forever marked by the Civil War are crucial to understanding the ways in which soldiers understood their service to the Union and their place in post-war American society. Rather than seamlessly aligning themselves with the rhetoric of promised rehabilitation and recuperation propounded by the penmanship contest, they presented fragmented bodies and fractured selves that were in the process of be becoming whole again. Their missing limbs could not be restored, and their left arms could, and their right arms could never do. Or sorry, their left arms could never do the work of two hands. However, left arm corps veterans present to the public reconfigured forms of masculinity and bodily ability, preserving the memory and legacy of their sacrifice and service. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Johnson, thanks. We're going to send her in to sign books, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> you want to learn more, thank this you. is where you need to go. So we want to thank her for coming. Please visit her in the museum lobby. She'll be signing right in the left inside the door with her book, so go in and get a copy. 
Uh, we also should say, remember, that the Friends of the National Parks of Gettysburg, Gettysburg Foundation's membership wing, it's the reason why we're able to present programs like this. So we ask you to go in, visit the Friends Desk. If you're not a member, become a member today. Help support these programs that we have here for Gettysburg National Military Park. Once again, we want to thank Dr. Johnson. We're going to see you back here in this tent at 1.30 for Ron Coddington, who's the editor of Military Images Magazine, doing Faces of Gettysburg. Back here at 1.30.